Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. But before we get started, I want to share a few words about a new advertiser here at Basketball History 101 and the Sports History Network. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a sports history fan. And if you're into sports history, you need to check out newspapers.com. At newspapers.com, you can get access to over 640 million pages worth of news from the U.S., Canada, England, Scotland, Ireland, and more, dating all the way back to 1798 and up till yesterday. I recently checked it out, and it has got everything. If you want to do some research on a moment in history, whether it's sports, politics, business, whatever, they will have what you need. Get a free one-week subscription to newspapers.com by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. And with a paid subscription, you will also be helping to support the production of this and other Sports History Network shows. That's sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. So let's get into today's story. We're going to talk about someone who had a very short NBA career. In fact, if he were just a regular player, he would fall into that category with hundreds of other players who stuck around in the NBA just long enough to have a cup of coffee and his career was already over. So why are we even talking about this guy? Well, it's because after just one year after leaving the NBA, he was playing Major League Baseball. And then after that, he was the lead in one of the biggest TV shows of all time. His name was Chuck Connors, and he is most famous for his TV character, Lucas McCain, better known as The Rifleman. But let me take you back to the beginning of the story. He was born on April 10, 1921 in Brooklyn, New York as Kevin Joseph Connors. Chuck was a nickname that he picked up in college, but I'll get to that part of the story in a moment. He was born to parents of Irish descent who emigrated to the United States from Eastern Canada. His father, Alan, worked as a longshoreman, and both of his parents eventually gained their American citizenship and raised young Kevin as a Catholic. He even served as an altar boy at the Basilica of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Brooklyn. Even as a child, he showed himself to be a good athlete. He was always a little faster than the other kids, and his athletic skills just seemed to come more naturally to him than to other boys. And like any boy who grew up in Brooklyn in the 1930s, He was a huge fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team. If he couldn't get to see a game in person, then he would sit next to the radio listening to the play-by-play of the game. The Dodgers were his first love. As he grew up into his teenage years, he became a local star in both baseball and basketball. He had a number of athletic scholarships to choose from. He decided that he wanted to attend Seton Hall University just across the Hudson River in nearby New Jersey on a baseball scholarship. There, he could play for both the basketball team and the baseball team, and he was a standout in both sports. So essentially, the basketball team got him for free since the scholarship was being paid by the baseball team. And that is where he picked up his lifelong nickname. At first base, he was known for often saying, Chuck it to me. He said it so often that his teammates started to call him Chuck. He liked it, and the name stuck. But after just two years at Seton Hall, he had offers to play professional baseball in the minor league level, and he took one of those offers. He joined the New York Yankees organization as a first baseman. His time playing minor league baseball was relatively non-eventful, 
But after just one year of baseball at the professional level, he enlisted in the U.S. Army as the United States was entering World War II. He served as a tank warfare instructor at Fort Campbell in Kentucky, and he also taught tank warfare at West Point, New York, which is home to the United States Military Academy. He distinguished himself as an instructor and earned the rank of sergeant. And after the Allied forces won the war, things began to wind down in the United States military and many servicemen began to return to their old lives, including Chuck Connors. And this is actually a great place to take a break. We'll be right back with Chuck Connors' return to professional sports. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let's get back to Chuck Connors and his return to professional sports. It was now 1945. The war was over, and Chuck needed to do something to pay the bills. He was able to sign a basketball contract with the Rochester Royals for the 1945-46 season. The Rochester Royals are known today as the Sacramento Kings. But when he played for them, the team was not even in the NBA. They played in a completely different league, but would eventually join the NBA when their original league began to stumble financially. But there was talk of a new basketball league getting formed, and there was interest to have him join that new league. At the height of 6 foot 6 or 198 centimeters, he had plenty of height to compete at the top level of basketball. And that's how Chuck Connors became one of the original players in the NBA's inaugural season of 1946-47. He was signed away from the Royals by the Boston Celtics. Chuck Connors was one of the original Boston Celtics. And in only the second game in franchise history, Connors pulled a Daryl Dawkins. During the warm-ups for a home game against the Chicago Stags, Connors went up to dunk the ball and shattered the backboard. He delayed the start of the game by an hour while they replaced the glass and reattached the rim. It was only the first week of this new league, and he just became its most famous player. By the way, they lost that game to the Stags by a score of 57-55, to but his fame as a basketball player wouldn't last very long. As a member of the Celtics, he averaged 4.6 points per game, appearing in 49 games that season. It was a decent start and he had a career high of 15 points in a game against the Cleveland Rebels. However, during his second season, his average dropped to just three points per game, and he only appeared in four games before getting cut by the team. And just like that, his basketball career was finished. For many, the dream of playing in the NBA is so engulfing that to lose your spot in the league can be extremely devastating. However, Chuck was an overall athlete, and he had other options. So he returned to baseball and joined the Brooklyn Dodgers organization, the team that he dreamed of playing for as a kid. But he wouldn't join the big club right away. He had to continue developing with the minor league club in Montreal. They were called the Montreal Royals. And there, he continued to develop as a first baseman during the 1947 and 1948 seasons. And he finally got the call up to play for the big club, the Brooklyn Dodgers. He joined them for the 1949 season, but he only played a single game for the Dodgers. He had one at bat and was thrown out at first base. He never even took the field for the Dodgers. His one plate appearance was the entirety of his time with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was then sent back to Montreal to continue developing. And with little prospect of getting back to the major league level, he asked the Dodgers to sell his contract to the Chicago Cubs where he thought he might have a better chance to play at the top level. The Cubs bought his contract and assigned him to their minor league farm club, the Los Angeles Angels. Now this is not to be confused with the current Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. They are just different clubs that happen to share the same name. But what Chuck Connors didn't know is that his big break would come from playing baseball in Southern California. He was tall and handsome and had a very outgoing personality. At the time, no major league baseball team existed in California yet. So this minor league club was the only baseball in town and it was common to see celebrities at these games. 
so he began to cross paths with Hollywood people that thought he would be great on film or television. The idea was very intriguing, but he still had a contract to play baseball. But the relationships that he developed in the film industry would serve him well just a couple of years later. For the 1951 season, he made it back to the major leagues and became the Chicago Cubs starting third baseman for 66 games. He had a total of 201 at-bats with a batting average of 239 and an on-base percentage of 282 with two home runs. But after that season, he realized that he would have much more fun in Hollywood than in the majors. He packed up and moved back to Southern California and within just a few weeks of arriving, he landed his first movie role. He played the minor role of police captain in a movie called Pat and Mike. It was a picture that starred Spencer Tracy as Mike and Katherine Hepburn as Pat, short for Patricia. The premise of the movie was that Pat, being played by Hepburn, was a sports superstar, but she always played poorly when her fiancé was in the stands. And that's where Mike comes in, played by Spencer Tracy. His character was the agent who took it upon himself to make sure that Pat's fiancé never came anywhere near her matches. The movie also featured the real-life Babe Diedrichsen, one of the greatest athletes of all time. It also starred a very young Charles Bronson, Jim Backus, who was later famous for playing Mr. Howell on Gilligan's Island, and Carl Switzer, who played Alfalfa on The Little Rascals. From there, Chuck Connors continued to get small parts in movies and TV shows. He appeared in an episode of Superman and Gunsmoke. And it was that appearance on Gunsmoke that convinced producers that Connors would be great in a western. So when the show The Rifleman was being developed, he was the guy they wanted for the lead. And this was his most famous role. On The Rifleman, he played widower Lucas McCain, who ran a cattle ranch in New Mexico with his son Mark by his side. He would often help the local sheriff keep the town clean of robbers and other bad elements. And he always had his trusty rifle with him. It was a modified rapid-fire Winchester rifle, and his character of McBain was a total dead shot when it came to that rifle. For 168 episodes over five years, he handled that rifle like no one else and in the process became one of the most recognizable faces in America. Even after the show ended, he still performed in mostly westerns, but he also did a few detective shows. Basically, being a person in authority and who could handle himself with a weapon became his bread and butter. And at this point, you might be asking yourself, wasn't there another player in the NBA called the Rifleman? And yes, there was. His name was Chuck Person. He mostly played in the 90s and his mother was a huge fan of The Rifleman. She just loved that show. So when she had her first child, she named him Chuck Connors Person, after Chuck Connors. And just by coincidence, Chuck Person grew up to become one of the NBA's first three-point specialists. He was deadly from the outside. So because he was so good at shooting from distance and given his name, it was natural that he also bear the nickname of the Rifleman. Now, back to Chuck Connors. He would continue to act regularly until shortly before his death in 1992 at the age of 71. Of course, most people remember him for his TV show and for his acting in general. After all, he did spend 40 years as an actor. But the reason we talk about him on this episode is to remind everyone that he also played for the Celtics, and he was one of the players who helped get the league started in its very first season. While his contribution was small, it was a contribution nonetheless. If it were not for Chuck Connors and all of the other hundred or so players from that first season, who knows if he would even still have an NBA today. And if you get a chance, try and go catch an old episode of The Rifleman. I watched several episodes for my research, and I'm going to go back and watch some more. It's a good show, and you can probably find it streaming somewhere. As I was preparing this story, the thing that stuck out to me was the idea that for most people, the opportunity to be a professional athlete would be the pinnacle of anyone's career. But not for Connors. In his case, playing both professional basketball and professional baseball was just a detour on the way to something even bigger. His career as an athlete became a side note in his life. Now, like Forrest Gump once said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And that pretty much encapsulates Chuck Connors' life. He had no idea he would be an actor someday. It just kind of happened, and he was really good at it. 
So that wraps things up for today's story on Chuck Connors. Join us next week when I share the history of the blocked shot and how it developed into a potent defensive weapon. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our Facebook page. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more stories from the past. And don't forget to check out SportsHistoryNetwork.com for more information on my podcast and the rest of the podcasts on our network. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.